We are going to look at experiment designed to gain a better understanding of consumer behavior. Do you want to try it? Sure. Isn't this something like a lie detector? We ask people questions and we expect to get the right answer. Marketing today has suffered billions, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent everywhere on marketing. We suppose for two million television commercials throughout life, that's the same as watching eight hours of television commercials seven days a week for six years. The economy is in recession, so every dollar spent must make a big difference. Neuromarketing makes every dollar spent in marketing extremely efficient. So neuromarketing is using new sophisticated brain research techniques. And in principle, they all have one objective, that is to understand our non-conscious part of the brain. That's Understanding our subconscious is all very well, but to what end? Such understanding can improve the way in which we look after ourselves, but can it also be used to gain more of an influence over us? These questions are currently being discussed by the French National Assembly. Members of Parliament are wondering about the ethical issues presented by neuroscience, and particularly by neuromarketing. Of course, as researchers and doctors, we are interested in the brain. What's new is the fact that advertising executives and video game developers are now interested in our brains. There is now a billion dollar industry built around brain science, mainly in the United States, but it is starting to arrive over here. Neuromarketing is the use of neuroscience techniques alongside classical marketing techniques, which means trying to see how the brain reacts to something new, for example products, ad campaigns or movie trailers. Neuromarketing is very simple. You analyze brain waves to get at the effectiveness of marketing advertising, merchandising, brand, in-store, everything. But without asking people questions, you're looking at it directly from the brain, directly, with no interpretation, no human interpretation, but directly reading it. The way functional MRI works is we can dissect um, brain areas with millimeter resolution. These techniques, which allow us to look at the implicit processes or unconscious processes that, that um, largely determine our behavior, we can begin to ask and interrogate the brains of consumers to say, what is it that you really want? How can industry be sure that what it makes are the things that people really want? And here the story begins, at the Opinion Center. These women are doing research. And these women are doing research too. The women you have just seen are not professional researchers. They're simply housewives from all over the country. But all these women are doing research concerned with products for the home. Research on style, utility, and sales. Way before this kind of images existed, a long time ago, life was simple. Objects were rare and were made in demand. The market stayed local and competition was non-existent. Marketing, therefore, was pointless. 
And then homo industrialists embarked on the era of mass production. From that moment on, the market had to expand and competition appeared. Homo industrialist no longer knew his clients personally. He manufactured first and sold later. Everything speeded up and the market became saturated. Supply was greater than demand. Then came the depression of 1929, which was when offensive marketing first appeared. Finding new clients and getting rid of competitors became essential for good business. Communication tools multiplied and brands became emblematic of products. Using consumer behavior studies at its base, marketing claimed it was achieving the holy grail. Knowing what the consumer preferred. When there is a crisis and everybody is on a budget, right? People don't have money to spend. They don't feel wealthy. Everybody feels poor today. It doesn't matter who you are, even Bill Gates feels poor today, right? Uh, we are very careful with what we spend. Therefore, a marketeer must work very hard to convince us that they have something worthy enough of our money, of our time, and of our attention. Oh, I like that one. I prefer that one on the right. I like this one here. Now, how accurate are the Opinion Center findings? Well, so far, they have never been wrong. In fact, it's well known that 80 to 90 percent of all products which are launched fail within their first year of hitting the marketplace. Now, those will be backed by focus group or questionnaire data. So there's clearly a gap between what people are telling you and what they do. There are major problems with classical marketing techniques, such as questionnaires and focus groups. Questionnaires are biased, and focus groups can be dominated by one person who, mentally speaking, seizes power over the others because of his or her personality. The advantage promoted by the neuromarketing industry is the non-verbalization aspect. People are not asked what they think. If you take Apple, right, and you say, what does brand Apple mean? You may say, Apple means hip, cool, and sexy. Apple means user-friendly. And Apple means cutting edge. The traditional approach to doing that is to go to somebody and say, do you think Apple is hip, cool, and sexy? Do you think Apple is cutting edge? But the moment I ask you a question, I have already biased the answer. If you ask a person, you can never get the answer. So that is why we measure it deep in the subconscious where the brand truly resides. The members of the jury are asked to consider a number of different characteristics. So asking consumers questions doesn't really work. But why? Why don't consumers tell the truth? Do they lie? Are they afraid of admitting to their preferences? For brioche over green beans, for example, or for chocolate over lettuce? Or is it because they don't actually know what their own preferences are? Are our choices the result of our emotions rather than our reason? The members of the jury are asked to consider a number of different characteristics. Deep in the subconscious. It is highly reassuring for us to believe that everything we do is carefully weighed and measured. But if we look properly at the way in which we make decisions, emotion has a big role to play. In the beginning, man needed a brain to breathe, eat, flee from danger and reproduce. And then, little by little, he started to want to think, to conceptualize and to theorize. To do this, he relied solely on his reason, believing that emotion would get in his way. Well, he was wrong. Reason is nothing without emotion. We owe this recent discovery in large part to the study of an extraordinary character, the American Phineas Gage. Phineas worked on railroad construction sites in the middle of the 19th century. All his work colleagues liked him. He was polite, conscientious and accurate. He was, in a word, reliable. Until the day when a crowbar accidentally dislodged part of his brain. 
As incredible as it seems, he survived the accident and only lost his left eye. After a period of convalescence, he went back to work and it was a disaster. Nothing was the same as before. He was short to try to justify our choices rationally after the event. as why do you like that mobile phone or why do you choose that car don't really tell us much about the innermost desires of the consumer what we do every day is irrational in fact what's so funny is we as consumers think we are deeply rational but 85 percent is actually deeply irrational and that's the reason why brands still affect us. Because in the end of the day, brands are just emotions you put on top of a product. In reality, you cannot touch it, you cannot feel it. It's just in our minds. And that's the reason why you know, this whole neural marketing is taking off so quickly because the, the industry has been desperate to find out ways how we can understand the irrational mind because it's such a strong battleground in order to build brand equity in our brains. Imprinting a particular brand on our brain, therefore, could only work through the decoding of our subconscious. The largest neuromarketing study in the world conducted to date is the book Biology, Truth and Lies About Why We Buy. Its Danish author, Martin Lindström, is a veritable marketing guru. He promotes himself all around the world through numerous conferences. Time magazine recently elected Lindström one of the hundred most influential people on the planet. At his conferences, he has no qualms about overturning the received ideas of his audience. How many of you would say that you are deeply irrational in everything you do every day? Raise your hand. One young lady is standing up there. Now you know how she looks like. Stay away from her. This is a serious problem. <laughs> Thank you for being so honest. Liars! <laughs> okay, now you have to be honest. How many of you knock on wood? Raise your hand. Seriously, you did not raise your hand previously, right? Right. Why do you touch wood? It's luck. It's for luck. So how do you know it works? It doesn't. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> So did you, did you sort of have five pieces of wood at home, five pieces of plastic and five pieces of stone and then you're knocking away here to see what works? No. We are deeply irrational every day. Our emotional reactions are involuntary, pretty much automatic. Emotions are centered in the lower part of the brain, the thalamus. The thalamus is not consciously controlled. Emotion for me is uh, funny because if you ask uh, a brand owner today, they will say, I'll show you a beautiful photo of a lady holding a baby in the arm and they'll say that's emotion. For me, emotion is non-conscious. It's something we have problems expressing, something which just takes place without us being aware of why we feel what we feel. So emotions is basically the essence of what brands is. <laughs> I'm beginning to see now how important it is to understand your emotions. However, emotions has been totally misunderstood over the last couple of years by the world of advertising. The main reason why is because we haven't been able to measure it. Actually, it measures and records all kinds of emotional responses. Psychologists and doctors have been trying to measure emotion for a long time, but so have marketing managers. 
an understanding of what moves us deep inside, what motivates our choices. This is what more and more neuromarketing companies are offering. In this experiment, we see that the skin temperature gradually drops from 0.80 on the graph to about 65. This is your captain again. Here in Berkeley, Neurofocus, one of the largest neuromarketing companies in the world, maintains that it can measure the efficiency of a commercial using an electroencephalogram. We look at brain waves and uh, we have 64 sensors. Each one of the sensors monitors the brain at 2,000 times a second. So in one second, we get 128,000 data points. Imagine what you get in 30 seconds. What do you get in one minute? It's billions of data points, right? With this, we measure three parameters. Only three parameters precisely. The same way, precision and being precise is very important to us. We are a science-based company. Avec la potéchémie, mon chien a le sourire. L'efficacité publicitaire s'appuie ici sur la tendance à la joie. Si mon chien sourit, je souris. Hein? Optimisme sur pâté plus racine de chien sur maître égale sourire au carré. We are a science-based company. Pas mal, ça. Intéressant. We measure her brain waves in response to a 60-second ad. And from that, we actually took three of our uh, metrics, which is attention, emotion, and memory. From that, we're able to derive an overall effectiveness score that we apply to the ad that we just did. As you can see by the graph behind me, as if we go directly down, each one has its own individual score, but if we combine all three, we form an effectiveness score. This ad overall performed very well. As you can see from the three metrics, we have attention, which is very high. Now, attention of all the metrics is the easiest one to capture, so that's why it's always high. But if you look at emotional profile, you can see it goes up and down a lot. And that's what we want to see. If a person has too high emotion, we can get what's called burnout. They just get tired of the ad very quickly. So going up and down is very good. The last one is the memory. And the memory is the hardest of all to capture. If you can get, in this case, uh, we say this is a good ad because the memory right out the beginning is really high. The best thing is at the end, if you get memory spiking, as you see at the end, it really goes up. That means if you're placing your brands or your messages at the end of an ad, this is really good and you know, you know that consumer is going to walk away remembering that brand or ad. So neuromarketing companies are after our memory. But what do scientists say about the way memory works? Is it really so simple to decode? And does the fact of remembering an advert really guarantee that someone will buy the product? Hello, I'm Fabio Babiloni. Nice to meet you. So, today we're going to make an electroencephalogram recording of your brain activity while you, you are going to watch a movie. Now, we're going to set you up. Here, in Italy, Fabio Babiloni, a neuroscience researcher, is trying to unravel the way in which memory works, but not for the same reasons. He and his team want to understand the mechanisms involved in brain function by observing activity in a brain that remembers and also in a brain that forgets. The best way to do this is still through advertising. Now that you have your cap on, we will begin recording while you watch the movie. It's important that you stay relaxed. Don't move around too much. Fabio's experiments consist of showing a documentary film interrupted by commercials to people whose brain waves he's digitally recording. His guinea pigs don't know what the scientists are looking for or what will be asked of them later. Babylon invites them back a week later and then asks them which commercials they remember. 
and surprisingly, a remembered commercial does not trigger the same activity in the brain as a forgotten one. No! We conducted this study on 20 people. The results of these experiments show that when we're looking at something we're going to forget, brain activity is very much isolated. Each area of the brain communicates with neighboring areas. To give you a picture of this, it's as if every area of the brain were making a local phone call to neighboring areas. Hello? So one area will talk to this one, but not that one. Another area will talk to this one here, but not that one over there. However, when we watch commercials that leave a trace in our memory, the results show that the different areas of the brain make long-distance calls, so to speak. So this area will actually talk with that one, and all areas intercommunicate more intensely. In the examples that we've seen, the ability to remember is not necessarily linked to the capacity or desire to buy the product. For example, I'm sure we all remember really bad commercials and products that we have no intention of buying. Remembering a commercial, therefore, does not necessarily mean that we're going to buy the product. But what about their emotions? Are they involved in the purchase decision? And why such interest in the process of decision making? Because without realizing it, we spend our time making decisions. For the clothes we wear to the actions we perform every day, our life is a succession of decisions. Here, in Palo Alto, researchers are interested in the role played by emotion in decision making. With this in mind, they're looking at the decision involved in making a purchase, because it is quick and easy to observe. Our lab has been, become very interested in, and some other labs too, is what happens emotionally, not only as the result of something that happened to you, like you got an A on your test, or you just won $100, but also before that thing happens, before you make the decision, and before you find out what happens, are you in an emotional state? And if you are in an emotional state, can that influence your decision and your behavior? We did an experiment in which we wanted to investigate how people purchase things, because purchasing buying things, shopping, is a ubiquitous economic decision that most of us make. Uh, and it's of obvious interest to economists, marketers, psychologists, and so forth. In order to see whether emotion can predict our buying behavior, Brian Knutson asked his guinea pigs to shop whilst being observed under an MRI scan. At the beginning of the experiment, he gave them $40. Then he showed them a series of goods they could either buy or not. They could leave with their shopping and keep any money that was left over. Surprisingly, Brian Knutson was able to predict their buying decisions even before they voiced them, just by looking at their brain activity. We found that if we looked at activation in a certain part of your brain involved in anticipating good things, uh, called the nucleus accumbens, when people saw a product, if we saw more activation in that area, people were more likely to say yes, even before they had seen the price. Okay. But when they saw the price, if we saw activation in another part of your brain that seems to be involved in anticipation of bad things and, and other functions as well, but uh, this, this would include things like uh, anticipating a shock or anticipating seeing a disgusting photo or seeing somebody else in pain. If we saw more activation in this anterior insula region, when people saw a price, they were more likely to say no. Being moved by a TV commercial, remembering it, are now measurable criteria. But is that sufficient? Does a commercial have the same impact regardless of where it is placed in the programming schedule? Neurosense, Europe's largest neuromarketing company, has conducted a survey on the involvement of spectators when they watch a TV commercial. MTV, which commissioned the survey, wanted to know if there was a way to fine-tune advertising slot rates according to the surrounding programs. 
Once again, a guinea pig under an MRI scan watches a program, in this case South Park, intercut by commercials. Where were you the day the tsunami struck? Where were you the night of the Paddington Rail disaster? Where were you the day a million people fled Sudan? The Red Cross were there, and we're there today around the world for millions of people whose lives have been devastated by crisis. This is actually real-time capability. So this is actually Dave's data. And David's obviously watching this. We can see the visual areas and the auditory, auditory areas are responding, so we, can, we know that the experiment is working. What we found was almost the whole brain was much more active when ads were placed and perceived in a congruent programming context than when they were placed in an incongruent one. So you can see areas involved in memory encoding, attention, comprehension, emotional uh, saliency, uh, and, and so forth. So a, a large range of brain areas here. If you look at the um, flip side and we, and we say, are there more, which, which brain areas were more active when uh, we look at the incongruent, incongruent programming context, we see this, right? So again, these are exact data to exactly the same stimuli. So you can see that there really is an advantage to placing programming, and we can actually quantify this to this extent as well, uh, how much more or less encoding, for example, memory encoding is going on in an appropriate context. Um, it just shows you the advantage of placing your advert um, in a commonsensical fashion rather than paying top dollar to go on to prime time if it's in an incongruent context. And this was not obvious. I mean, the intuition that you can't put a Red Cross ad in the middle of South Park is not obvious. A absolutely. It seems to, to us, doesn't it? But the thing is, how are you going to measure that? There, are, there, there were no objective measures. So in order to make an industry change the way it does things, even though it seems like uh, common sense to us that that should be the case. Nevertheless, ads are still placed uh, in, in, inappropriately in prime time uh, viewing. You and I are exposed for two million television commercials throughout life. That's the same as watching eight hours of television commercials seven days a week for six years. We cannot remember all of this stuff. So in order for us to survive, we need to select. And what we know from our you know, brain now is that our brain do the selection for us. If it did not do that, we'll crash as a computer. So what we remember is things which are in context, which are relevant for us. Things which are out of context is literally deleted from our brain. Well, guess what? 99.9% .9 of all the ads you see today is out of context. That's the reason why it doesn't work. That's the reason why we are irritated as consumers. Good news then. Our brains, which all things considered are pretty clever, sort through the mass of advertising that surrounds us. Nevertheless, whilst they're capable of selection, what they love about all is reassurance. And this is where Lindstrom has made a surprising discovery. The feelings of security and of belonging to a community function in exactly the same way in our brains with regard to brands as they do with regard to religion. To support this, Lindstrom hands over to a minister. The parish of a brand and the parish of a church have a great deal of similarity. Uh, there's a question of loyalty. People make a choice and uh, there's this happy feeling of loyalty to the choice that they've made because whatever choice they made reflects a real preference. Something makes them feel good, something that delivers for them. Uh, and so there is every connection between branding in a religious sense and branding in a commercial sense. It's just simply a psychological and I believe a spiritual fact. Exactly three years ago, I decided to jump on a plane as a reflection of those results from the biology project. I wanted to find out what are the pillars in religion which really makes it so powerful. I'm not saying we're creating a religion here, I'm saying we're learning from the, the world of religion. <laughs> Thank you.
when we took the brands like Apple and Harley Davidson and the face of Christianity, we saw an incredible activation in the brains of the center region, sense of belonging, fear area, a lot of fear, by the way, but very powerful stuff. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. Whereas we took brands like BP and Microsoft and compared it with those brands, the activation we saw on the brain was somewhat almost non-existent. This is interesting stuff. Because this is an indication of that religions which have been around for two to three thousand years, it's not a coincidence. There's some fundamental elements it touches in our behavior. And as we live in a world where fear is so prominent in our lives, it actually starts to make sense now that brands are learning from it. What, Moses? We are fucking lost. If I ask you, are you loyal to something, your response would be, no, I am not a dog. I am not loyal to anything. I look for the best things. But deep in your subconscious, you may be loyal. You may be unwilling to accept or admit to yourself. <laughs> so we don't ask you. So what I do, I tell you, hey, listen, I'm going to show words that appear and disappear on the screen in half a second intervals. Some of the words have a red dot on them. Some of them don't. Your job is to find the words that have a red dot on them. So what happens, uh, every time a word shows up on the computer screen and it has a red dot on it, your brain goes, aha, there it is. There's the word of the red dot. We call it the aha response of the brain. There's a particular neurological term called the P300 response, a particular unique neurological signature, right? Anytime one of the brand words show up and the brand words will not have a red dot on them, all right? Yet, if they show up and they mean something deep in your subconscious, your brain will still go, aha. The difference very clearly tells you how much the brand really resonated and imprinted on your subconscious. If advertising is done well, it is a religion. Um, it is at least part of one of the elements religions are creating. Remember, religion has 10 pillars making it become powerful. And one of them is actually called evangelism. Now, you could say that advertising is partly part of evangelism. A little bit like when you go to a church. I hope I'm not offending anyone by saying a church is a flagship store, right? And you have the logo on cross, which is, you no. Know, so you have a lot of parallels going on here. Now, a church would never do this because that would be too much for a church. A church instead will let people spread the word of mouth so it becomes much more authentic. Guess what? Brands are starting to do exactly the same now. Bah, je les aime parce qu'ils sont bien, euh, ils sont, comment dirais-je, bien onctueux, vous voyez. Ah non, je préfère euh, mon... Can faithful consumers help to promote brands? Perhaps. But while brands ask the faithful for help, what kind of strategies can public authorities employ to get their prevention messages across? To dissuade us from smoking, for instance. Amongst his other discoveries, Lindstrom was surprised to note two things. Messages such as smoking kills are ineffective and sex does not sell. For me, the most surprising discovery from biology uh, was two things. Uh, one was we were testing the health warnings on the cigarette pack that actually they 
don't work. In fact, they have the total opposite effect. And that was a major surprise for me. This then is an example of a product that represents one of America's largest farm crops and one of the most controversial consumer articles. I work a lot with governments around the world to solve the, uh, the issue regarding smoking. And let me be frank, I probably will never solve it, but hopefully I can make the situation become better than it is right now. What we learned with health warnings on cigarette packs is that when you look at a cigarette pack, and you look at a health warning, it activates, first of all, the nucleus accumbens, which also is the same as the craving spot in your brain. Now, what happens is you look at that health warning, and then 10 seconds later, you light up your cigarette, and you feel good. And then after 10 minutes, you start that cyclist again. Well, guess what happens? You actually start to associate that health warning with feel good. Breathe easy, smoke clean. So what we wanted to do is actually to reverse that, to disconnect the links between a health warning and feel good. And the way you do that is to change the format of the health warnings all the time. Some days it's totally blank. One day is text. The third day is a picture. The fourth day the whole pack is red. You change the colors, the shape, the formats all the time to so disconnect the link between the Pavlos effect in principle and the health warnings. That is one of the advice I'm giving right now. <laughs> What's going on with sex then? That old trick so often used in advertising. Sex in advertising does not sell. And we know that from biology now. We thought it sold. It probably has been selling in the past. But there's two problems with it. The first thing is sex is so overwhelming in our brain that when we hear about it, we only think about sex. We totally forget about the brand. The second thing is that sex today is accessible everywhere. You can go to the internet and you can find it in two minutes. It's not, you know, wrapped in mystery anymore as it was just ten years ago. Because of that, it's not something creating attention. So when you do see, as I remember in France many years ago, a lady on billboards which was saying every week I think she had a cover of her breast and say, next week I'll, I'll show you more. That whole campaign which was incredibly successful was controversial and that was the reason why people were talking about it. Well, that cannot happen today. If you did that today in France, no one would react because we've seen it all. So sex doesn't sell. This is your captain again. Whilst it is pointless to appeal to our sexual desires, it is nonetheless essential to speak to our senses. Our hearing and our sense of smell is still far too neglected by advertising. The reason for this, according to some, is linked to human evolution. For despite years of evolution, some of our primitive instincts still prevail. Apparently, this is due to our reptilian brains. Some companies, such as the sales training company Sales Brain, have based their entire business on this argument. Good morning. What if you could create the right perception in the brain of your prospects? What if you could actually deliver your value proposition to the part of the brain of your clients that drives all their decisions. What would that mean for you? A lot more business. What would that mean for your businesses? Now what if neural marketing could give you a simple formula to do just that? And what if you could create the killer at ever speech in just three hours? I like selling. I like it here. I like the job too. I just hope the job likes me. Would that be worth your time this morning? Would that be worth your vestige dues for the next 10 years? <laughs> yes. Right? Well, good. Good morning. So my name is Patrick Renoise. I am French. Nobody's perfect, right? And as you know, I've spent my life in sales and marketing. But at the end of the day, I was not satisfied with what all this sales training had you know, taught me, so I had to write my own methodology. So here is what I'd like to do with you today. I'd like to give you an executive overview of what we know on how the brain works. On aide. We help companies to push the buy button in the brains of their audience. 
The sales brain method applies to everybody because it is based on influence. It applies to people who sell Airbus planes, nuclear power plants and yogurts, and even to mothers who want to get their children to leave for school on time. And I'm going to summarize in one slide what we know about the decision-making process. So as you can imagine, this is kind of an oversimplified description of how it goes. But for the purpose of what we do in marketing and sales, this is very effective. So here is what neuroscientists have discovered. Using functional MRI and other techniques to look at the brain, the trigger in the brain is actually the top of the stem and the portion that unite both hemispheres. This is referred to in the medical literature as the old brain. Sometimes people call it the reptilian brain. Sometimes people call it the limbic system. It doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that we use the most ancient part of our brain to make all our decisions. And there is a good news and there is a bad news. The bad news is we decide at the level of a crocodile. Why? Because we share this brain in common with reptiles. That's why it's called the reptilian brain. Now that brain, the reptilian brain, is actually very, very old. It's 450 million years old. So this is what neuroscientists call the preverbal brain. So the holy grail of neuromarketing is to find an image, story, or movie that will trigger a specific emotion, such as joy or sadness, or feelings of guilt, so that this emotion will in turn trigger a decision. So much for the holy grail of neuromarketing. So how can you go beyond word to express your value proposition? Body language is definitely one way. And we're, we're going to go look at you know, what you need to do to really be able to talk to an organ that does not even understand words. Now, I mentioned that there was you know, a bad news. But guess what? There is a good news. And the good news is that that brain is so ancient, it is so primitive, that it becomes almost predictable. The primitive brain, also called the reptilian brain, is easy to blame here. According to a theory developed in the 1960s, the brain is composed of three layers. The theory states that an archaic brain, the famous reptilian brain, makes up the oldest layer. Inherited from reptiles, this layer determines a certain amount of reflex behavior, such as aggressiveness and flight. The middle layer, inherited from the first mammals, is responsible for more complex behavior, linked to memory and emotion. The upper layer, the neocortex, facilitates abstract thought and language. Stemming from the successive stages of human evolution, the three brains have trouble communicating with each other. A bit like computers when confronted with new encoding systems. The problem with this theory is that it rests on false notions of brain anatomy and function, and a false picture of how the brain has evolved from one species to another over millions of years. In other words, if you get angry, don't blame it on your reptilian brain. The very idea that there might be any kind of trigger button in the brain belittles our most complex system. The brain is the most complex organ in our bodies, in terms of both structure and functioning. The idea that we have a criminal bump and a buy button is scientifically false. But it's a good marketing argument. Paul Valéry often said that what is simple is false, and what is not simple is useless. When it comes to selling neuromarketing, you will hear people talk about reptilian brains, buy buttons, instant decisions, contrast and fear. Unfortunately for marketers, and luckily for us, the consumers, the decoding of the brain is still a long way off. You'll have the... I'll just have a Coke. 
Is the neuro dimension of neuromarketing then above all a marketing argument? In the end, are all these measures actually useful? Do they work, or are they just a load of hot air? And if they do work, do we risk being increasingly influenced, if not manipulated? Today, absolutely no honest marketer will tell you that they have the ultimate solution, i.e. a commercial that is 100% effective thanks to neuroscience. Everything we know about the brain is overestimated by investors and by the industrialists. On the other hand, it would be hypocritical to say that neuromarketing doesn't work, that it is useless. Today we're in a situation where neuroscience can help with learning to read or treating certain conditions, and we all agree that it adds something in these cases. So if it adds something to studies of this kind, which are conducted for the public good, so to speak, it can also help to understand consumer behavior. We never go anything to do with manipulation. We merely measure. We don't create ads. We don't create subliminal anything. We go nowhere near it. Personally don't see there's a mechanism or economic viability in, in, in um, using imaging data or any psychological data, even focus group data, to try and manipulate um, consumers because the true fact of the matter is if you try and sell them something that they don't want uh, and you oversell it, then they don't buy it. Subliminal advertising, a very subversive technique which uses images flash before our eyes that last only a split second but just long enough to imprint in our vulnerable minds a product's name. Not just that either. Sophisticated vocal tricks are sometimes used without our realizing it at a conscious level. Nobody waited for MRI scans and brain images before manipulating people and getting them to buy things they didn't want or didn't know about. Manipulating or influencing consumers, you can play around with the words but basically getting consumers to make decisions that they didn't want to make, this is unique to marketing and applied consumer psychology. And I think that's why these so-called neuromarketers are interested in these techniques because they think, ah, here's a desire meter and now I'm going to manipulate all this stuff and see if it changes the desire meter. That's a very simplistic view of how the brain works, by the way. <laughs> this is the perfect project for you. This is the perfect project for us. The government should really go in and put some frameworks on what should be allowed and what should be illegal. A candle can provide light. A candle can burn a building. We, we should be careful in what we use the candle for and not blame the candle. So it's, I think it's hard to control the applications. On the other hand, I think it's essential for scientists to take responsibility for communicating their findings to the public and for commenting on the uses of those findings. I believe in, in, the, in the human race to make uh, wonderful things out of this knowledge. So I'm going to take the side that knowing more about ourselves can only make us better. This is really the good news, I think, for the consumer. We cannot place a buy bottom in consumers' brains, and thank God for that. Uh, we cannot in any way control people's thoughts, or for that sake, read what you're thinking. So we can rest assured, science, and particularly the science of neuromarketing, has its limits. Nobody's going to read our minds, not for the time being at least, but what about the future? In actual fact, here at the University of Pittsburgh, Professor Marcel Just's team has already begun to decode our thoughts. The objectives here have nothing to do with neuromarketing. Marcel's team is working principally on language, focusing particularly on autism. But what will happen when others get hold of his results? In the last few years, it's been possible to use fMRI to identify the contents of people's thoughts. Now, using new uh, comp computational techniques, machine learning techniques, we've been able to um, discover the, the relationship between particular patterns of brain activity and particular thoughts. How you doing, Justin? Are you ready to get started? Okay, then. It's about five and a half minutes long, um, so just stay as still as you can. 
Marcel Joss and his team have developed a software program capable of recognizing words such as telephone or truck being thought of by people undergoing an MRI scan. Words that the computer guesses just by looking at our brain activity. I think the word is apartment. Got it right. That's it. I that's think that's it. it got a 10 out of 10 in a, in a two choice test. It got a perfect score. It means that all of us, to some extent, when we think of a chair or an apple or a hammer or any physical object, very similar things are happening to our brain. Ten years from now, twenty years from now, I don't think we're going to need an MRI scanner. This, this electromagnetic activity is occurring in the brain and uh, some sensor will be able to detect it. And it'll be, you know, maybe we'll have some handheld little device, you know, hold it up and we'll be able to see what's going, in another, going on in another person's brain. It's sort of like a mental nudist colony. I don't know how to avoid the misuse of this. I think it's a wonderful new knowledge. I'm sure it can be used for evil. People ask about, you know, what about police interrogations? What about neuromarketing? I'm sure it can be used for, for, for bad reasons. Um, Currently, it requires the co uh, cooperation of a person. You know, I have to think Apple before anybody can see it. But ultimately, I think it will require less cooperation. So is it a bad thing if everybody knows what you're thinking? Well, it would mean the end of privacy, really. I think that we, as, as science develops the potential for manipulating, in good and bad ways, humanity are, are enormous just enormous. I think we're going to be able to change the nature of the human race. Do we want to create a new species? I think it will be possibly within our power to do that. It, it's, it's really, the, the thought is bigger than anything I can handle. I just don't know, do we want to do this? It's, I think it's one of the biggest questions that we will ever face, and, and soon.